What's going on, everybody? You know who it is. This is Austin, aka More Than an Agent, and this is the Real Estate Blueprint Podcast here with my Dominicano hermano, Jonathan Soto. Soto, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? The the daily grind, man. The daily, daily grind. grind. Daily grind. We're out, we're out here for it. So listen to today's guest, and we don't have it from that much. So we apologize if we if we get right into the nitty-gritty of it. But obviously, with an uh, individual of this particular cal- uh, caliber, uh, time is money, time is most important. And obviously, he has to um, uh, do what he has to do just in his own personal business and so on and so forth. If you don't know today's guest, if you don't know today's guest, you're probably not on bigger pockets. I can honestly say that like wholeheartedly. <laughs> and to be honest with you, If you're an investor, if you're looking to scale, if you're looking to take that next step in your business and you're not on bigger pockets, I can wholeheartedly say that, you know, our podcast is not the bigger pockets podcast. And you should be on that bigger (laughs) pockets podcast. It'll get there. It'll get there. It'll get past that too. Comma yet. It wasn't a period. It was comma yet, right? (laughs) So in this particular case, today's guest, today's guest, serial, serial contributor, on the Bigger Pockets podcast, blog, and platform. So please, you'll be able to find him not only here, but all over Bigger Pockets. He's heavy in the Midwest, specifically in Indianapolis and other Midwestern markets, which is going to be interesting because we've been preaching that we're seeing a lot of activity, especially in the Midwest. He started his own company along with a couple of others, and at least on the investing end, and now they own a little bit over 500 units which I'm pretty sure at this point, by the time that he gets off this podcast, which is why he has to cut his time short, by that time it might be 550, it might be 600, who knows? But he's building heavily. If I go into his whole entire bio, because it's that expensive, extensive, I should say, we're not gonna be able to get into this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to recognize who this man is. Oh, Sterling. you're gassing me up. You're right. gassing me up. Sterling, <laughs> Sterling, man. Welcome, thank you for coming on the show, man. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. And I would say everyone on here, if you're in a recliner, which I highly doubt you're in recliner, let's say you're in whatever seat you're in, go ahead and kick back, grab some popcorn, because we're going to take you along for a ride. Oh, 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 I love it. Are we starting love off it. on the rip? I love it. Let's, yeah, let's yeah, go. Yeah. So, 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 <laughs> let's go yeah, into it. so let's start it off. Let's start Talk it off. Us. Listen, man, I know you're not. I know you're not. No one's born like being a real estate investor. Nobody's born putting deals together, raising funds, raising money, creative financing. What was that turning point for you? How did you get into the business? How did you get into real estate? Yeah, so one, I'll just give a brief spark note version on uh, my upbringing. I'll keep it very brief for everyone. So I, humble beginnings, grew up in the roughest parts of the city of in, uh, Indianapolis, where when you would drive through the neighborhoods I grew up in is you would lock your doors and then also roll up the windows. Uh, single mother, fraternal twin brother, as dark as Wesley Snipes. No, he's definitely not that dark, <laughs> but uh, is uh, and grew up on welfare, Section 8 housing. I remember at one point, Austin, I was five years old, eating Raymond noodles and uh, cut up hot dogs with my brother right across from me. Uh, and then as soon as we go upstairs, there's a bullet that comes right through the back patio where we were sitting. So literally, you never knew if you would make it uh, to the, the next day. And luckily, my mother made this big move and moved us out from the inner city to more of the, the suburbs. Uh, that was by far the turning point for me in my life. We were still in lower income housing, but it was just a completely different uh, environment from the schooling, the people I was around too. Uh, and then my brother ended up going back to that environment and took a different trajectory in life and actually is facing a hard time due to the decisions that he's made. So that's one thing I really want to uh, preach to everyone or just my personal experience here is it truly is important the people you surround yourself with. Uh, and fast forward, how I got into real estate was uh, my uh, friend's dad owned a construction company, had some free time during the summers. This was around 19 years old. And that's how I got my foot in the door as a laborer. Uh, and then from there, I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I know a lot of people are familiar with that book. Uh, and then that's when I saw that the rich and wealthy did not get that way by being laborers. They were actually investors and then bought my very first single family house, uh, 23 years old, then scaled, uh, ended up buying 150. And then in 2017, that's when I started buying uh, multifamily with the first deal being a 46 unit and the most recent 156 unit. 
The, the thing I love it before Jonathan takes the next question, um, which is why it's so important. We, we really pride ourselves of being the podcast for the black and brown community for that very reason. So that way we can continue to share this knowledge. I didn't get a chance to do a drop. So everyone that's listening, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Don't forget to leave a rating and review as a quick plug as we continue to share this knowledge, because this is the reason, exactly the reason why we're doing this, because not only do people look like us, but people are growing up in these environments like us, right? So I want to put heavy emphasis on that be, because it's important because it, it helps it make it more, more relatable without a doubt. Agreed. But also one thing that really helped me as well as I understand a Black African American, however you want to, 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 to label that, my mother never really, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? had race come into to play and I, I i know that could be a double-edged sword uh when it comes to that but i was I, and of course i did run into some racism and all that stuff uh growing up but i was a lot shielded from that for lack of a better words and that really did help me because i didn't look at that as a excuse so that's one thing i do want to share with your audience uh, as well as i never decided to try and put myself in the box and i still want to be an example of, of people who came from that environment but that's just one thing from a mindset that really helped me yeah definitely i definitely agree with that so just take a step back. You mentioned you bought your first single family home, then you jumped to a 150 unit, or did you buy all that in one purchase, multiple purchases? How did that come about? Was it your own money? Let's let's break that down a little bit. So the very first property was a single family a house, and I had no, absolutely no money. I actually owed the bank money, just not being financially smart. So that was my very first deal. And I bought uh, 140 or so additional single families. And then in 2017, that's when I made the shift to multifamily because I don't have very much hair uh, due to uh, man having that many single families with the, the self-management uh, and then also all of the uh, transactions that you have to deal with because this wasn't a large portfolio. Uh, if we were lucky, both my partner Jacob and I, we would get a package maybe of three, but most of the time it was a lot of one-offs. Oh, wow. And it's interesting because we're, we're, we're in a market where we, we're, you know, we're heavily multifamily oriented and, and we're, you know, 25 minutes outside of the largest city, you know, in the, in the country being, you know, in New York City. And in that particular case, we, we kind of, it's weird, we kind of saw more people going that route to begin with. So we thought it was natural to start off with multifamily to begin with, but just smaller multifamily, three units, four units, three units, so on and so forth. Um, and it seems like you already pretty much answered that question, which is going to be my next one. What At what point was that pivot where you're going from single family into multi? And it just seems like just over time, just you realizing that in order to scale, it's actually going to require more work yes. on the one-offs than, you know, than if you would have just jumped into multifamily uh, wholeheartedly. Do you still have those? Do you still have those units as no. well? Or you, you still Out of all those single families, all gone. <laughs> I mean, the, the houses are still there, of course, but I no right, longer right. own the houses. Yeah. <laughs> you transferred everything into the, okay, gotcha. I, um, let's talk about just, okay, let's talk about the first big deal. The first 46, I think you said 46 units? Mm -hmm. Yes. 46 units. Walk us, walk us through that. Walk us through that. Was it, was it a mentor that, you know, was like, hey, you need to start looking into, you know, these bigger deals. What, talk to us about that, that first big deal. So it was a decision that was made. It was both uh, me and my, uh, me and uh, Jacob, we took a step back and said, do we want to continue on this path of being in the single family home space? Because uh, both in Indianapolis and about 120 uh, in Indianapolis, and then about 30 or so that was in Dayton, uh, Ohio, and said, okay, well, this is where we want to go long term, which model will enable us, enable us to, to get to that point. And it was, we took, at that point, we uh, said, well, we no longer want to do a uh, single family because just the previous four, four and a half years or the previous three, three and a half years. And then that's when we settled on. Uh, we didn't even look at RV parks. We didn't do self uh, look at self storage. We said, OK, let's go multifamily. And then that's when the decision was made. And that's one thing I always mention to people is that first you got to make a decision. And then the second step was, OK, now how do we start to get these deals into our pipeline, which we were going through brokers. 
which people and this was in 2017 when the market was really starting to heat up and everyone was paying 10 15 20 percent more than what we thought was our aggressive uh, offer so that's when we took another pivot which i believe entrepreneurship is all about is just taking the feedback from the the market the market is the market and said okay well let's beat the brokers to the punch and then that's when we started the direct owner and took the driving for dollars approach and found this one particular uh, property that uh, parking lot looked like an alligator's back <clears throat> excuse me <laughs> looked like uh, alligator's back uh, and it was just very bland uh, so ended up picking up the it's all public records so find out who owned the property and just picked up the phone and said yay or nay are you looking to sell your property of course that wasn't the actual pitch I mean, you could right. potentially do that but uh uh that Maybe that's what it was yeah exactly oh, oh what was that no that's fine continue oh and it, it turned out that this was the very last property that he was looking to to sell. And then that's when the process uh, went from there is uh, total purchase price was $900,000 and only had to put down $200,000 uh, because it was a seller finance deal. Wait, was this in... Uh, uh... Was this in Indianapolis or yes. was this in, okay. In Indianapolis. in Indianapolis. And I know people are doing the math on that and saying, uh, let's say they're in California. I can't even get a single family house uh, for that much. <laughs> so that's also the disclaimer is that in Indianapolis, uh, the properties are significantly cheaper. Yes. So once you started shifting over to multifamily, you started going directly to the owners. So before that, you were dealing straight with the brokers, real estate agents, anything on the market. How were you financing those all those single family homes? All cash. Cash. And so it would start with friends and family and would buy 10. So would buy these uh, properties. These were these were built. 1970s 1960s so there were older built properties i would say the average rent was 700 750 and would be all in with the rehab as well as the uh, purchase price about forty thousand dollars so it was just purchasing all cash friends and family would buy 10 single families uh, and then from there this was through all the efforts through bigger pockets and doing all the networking was we would then raise money from outside investors in essence the bird method but instead of a bank is outside investors cash our friends and family out go do that over again and then the investors that came in they would get a return from the cash flow that's interesting and, and because like even like i mean our properties here like you know single families uh you know are still going to run you a couple hundred thousand dollars um which was which we were putting heavy emphasis on on the Midwest. Uh, so I, I bought a, a duplex in Cleveland last year just to get started, like with that out of state journey. Uh, you mentioned Dayton, uh, which- I was looking at a 40 unit in Dayton. And, which ironically, I, and I, don't, I don't know, you know too much you know, like on, on Dayton, but it, it, it you know, you, with your major cities, you have Dayton, you, have, you know, you have Dayton, you have Cleveland, you have Columbus, you have Cincinnati, and then you have, you know, maybe like an Akron, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess Akron's only there because of LeBron James, right? Which is the only reason why people know like what Akron. Well, the was, Hall of Fame. I think the Hall of Fame's there too, aren't they? The Which one? the the Hall of Fame, the inductee, or something. I believe that's actually in Akron, or yeah, I may be a oh, little bit confused. I know the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is in Cleveland. <laughs> hey, yeah. see, it's it's like the NFL ones out there too. That's right. Possibly, I um, I haven't, I haven't been to Akron yet, but but shout out to Akron before like uh, our, our podcast gets canceled. But shout out, <laughs> shout out, shout out to Akron. <laughs> um, uh, here's the interesting aspect of it. Your uh, your partner. What traits do you think set up somebody that can be a good partner? Because most people think like a partner is just someone who's going to just have the money or somebody that, you know what I mean? It's very, what, what or here's a better question, because that's a little subjective. Uh, or actually, that's a little broad. What about your partnership makes it work for you? So partnerships with the investors or partnership, partnership with Jacob um, and the with, company? With Jacob and the company to start. Yeah, so I would say is, is the person a good person? first and foremost, uh, and do you enjoy working with them? So that's what I look at first and uh, foremost. And it's the same with hiring people uh, is I always look at, I mean, how do they treat other people? And with Jacob, there was nothing but uh, good things that everyone said. And 
funny story is that uh, I met him at a meetup uh, where he was working with an, another operator. And this is where I was working at my mentor. And there was just something about him when I was when he was on stage telling the story. Uh, and then uh, once he got off stage, he went to the bathroom and I followed him into the bathroom and gave him the pitch. Hey, let's start working together. Uh, all this. And that's just my aggressive nature. And then he gave me uh, his contact. And it was one of those things like, uh, here's because that happens is a lot of people I'm sure approach them and just not uh, serious. And he said, here's my office. Uh, and then I work where I work out of, uh, you can come by anytime. I was there the very next day and then the next day and then the next day and then the next day. And then we were doing separate projects at that time, but I would jump in and see how I could uh, help him in uh, any way. Cause he was further along in the real estate journey than I was. Uh, and then from there is we just started working together and, and, enjoyed working with them uh as well uh and then also just going out uh and having and i wouldn't say having a good uh good time but is that just the the ongoing working uh, relationship was good and then i like just work you said uh yeah it doesn't feel like work especially no, when you're working with no, I did it. And then on his side is he saw my work ethic because I was one of the first people in the office. And then also I was the last person to leave. And then we started doing some deals together and then we had a uh, success from that. And then that's when I planted the seed in his mind that, hey, let's go ahead and start this. Uh, let's start the, the company, this company. And that's uh, the but I would say the key thing is he was the complete opposite of me, meaning I was more of an extrovert. Uh, I'm not afraid to get my face uh, kicked in, not literally get my face kicked in, right, but right. not uh, so much afraid of rejection. I enjoy going out there, networking with people, being the face and the brand of the, the company. Uh, underwriting, I don't enjoy that so much. And he's the opposite. He enjoys being in the spreadsheets and doing the numbers. Uh, he's more of an operational person. Uh, when we're at, uh, at networking events, and I didn't know that at this time, this was my lack of self-awareness, that he didn't enjoy going out there and talking to people. And I, and I should have known that that's why that that was for me to do. So that's what I would say is one, enjoy working with the, the person. They're actually a good person too. And that's good to get references from other people and also work with them. It's the same as dating too, is you just don't, right, I right. mean, some people will just go ahead and jump into to marriage, all that. That's another conversation itself, but <laughs> is, and then also is the complementary of strengths and then weaknesses. It's a perfect analogy. I mean, for, I mean, like, like respectfully for my marriage, I mean, that's where everywhere where like I'm weak, like that's where my wife picks up, right? And like, and vice versa, like on her end, and like that, it, it's it's literally to the T, exactly that. Like in that, our harmonious, uh, just having somebody to back up your weaknesses, or more importantly, or I won't say more importantly, but or, or on an even scale, uh, just being able to do the stuff that you don't want to do, like just don't want to do. Yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly it. And managing, yeah, I mean, I could go down more rabbit holes when it comes to that, but we're on the same page. Yeah. So at the beginning, you were raising funds for single family homes, and now you move on to multifamily. How has the raising capital changed? Is it still friends and family? Is it outside? Are, are you dealing with more syndications? So let's let's talk about financing on that. On that yeah, it's it's all syndications and have shifted away from the, the friends and family and the transition from single family then to multifamily. This was also from a marketing standpoint. When I first started, let's say being on bigger pockets is a lot of the content that I had out there was on single families. So I had to start shifting my content mm -hmm. to more of multifamily to start to attract those investors. And then many, if I were to put a number on it, that there were some investors that came with us when we transitioned from single family to multifamily, but then there were some that wanted to stay on single family. So that's where the content marketing came into play to get additional investors. We've used some friends and uh, family uh, uh, cash. And on that very first deal, yes. But then as we started transitioning, the next deal was a 50 unit, the next was an 80 unit, and then so on. That's when it was just strictly more on the, the, the uh, uh, outside investors. Let's talk about syndication because it's an interesting part because like we're, you know, and, you know, with respect to me and Jonathan, we're about like combined, we're about like 35 units or so. And like, we're starting to really have that conversation probably more than ever of, of scaling and, and going to that next level. Right. And, and we're going to put you in the hot seat a little bit for like a coaching call because here, because I want to, I want the listeners to 
get an idea because syndication is that is that sexy word that's thrown out there that people have an idea right they know like okay raising funds like it can just equal syndication but i want to give you this hypothetical scenario and then you can let me know if this is if this is considered syndication or if this is something that is just a quote unquote you know just a formal agreement for a partnership so here we go um um, I'm going to be looking at property, say, in Cleveland, right? And if it's a it's a 40 unit, it's a 40 unit, it costs, you know, it, it's the purchase price is at, we'll, we'll just say 2 million. We'll say it's at 2 million. And how I, in theory, would uh, like to fund it or what I would be looking for is, and, I, and I'm going to give a real basic analogy because there's there's so many ways that you can that you can skin a cap. But the down payment on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, on the two mil, if it's if it's twenty five percent down, right? We're talking we're talking five hundred grand, right? So in that particular case, we need five hundred thousand dollars down. Now I know personally, out of that five hundred thousand dollars down payment, I can bring to the but table. But also, I want to say one more thing: Is there? And I I'm assuming there's going to be repairs that need to be done as far as upgrades too. Let's, so that's additional my, portion. Uh, yes, and and for because I don't want to lose the listeners with it um we'll just we'll just say two mil just and and it's an easy just take over it's running turnkey just gotcha. for a basic uh just for for numbers sake um so two mil it takes five hundred thousand for the for the down payment 25 percent down easy numbers uh out of the 500 down payment 250 i can put up and then i would raise the other quarter million mm -hmm. right and we would own that deal 50 50 out of the out of the profits, both off of the net cash flow and off of the appreciation, everybody who funded the 250, they would get their respective percentage based off of what they contributed to that 250. Here yeah, so far, yeah. right? So say if uh, say if one the, person did 250, they would get a hundred thousand dollars, hundred percent. Yeah, correct, correct. Um, and then if, if correct, so say if the, 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 the net cash flow at the end of the month, uh, we'll say just $10,000, there's just even numbers, $10,000 out of that net profit of $10,000, the individuals and the investors that put up the 250, they would be splitting the remaining $5,000 of that net profit. Mm -hmm. And then whatever they put in of that 250 would be respected to what they receive off of that $5,000 net profit and obviously the same goes for the appreciation is that a common technique is that quote unquote syndication because i know syndication like it's, it's a little bit more in depth bring me through just you know is that a, a good strategy is that a solid standpoint what would you do differently give us your experience just with that particular example I would say on a high level, that is fine. We have to likely would have to dig a little bit more into the weeds, but I'll just give you an example of an actual deal. This was 156 units in Indianapolis. Total purchase price was $6.2 million. 69% uh, came from the lender. So about 5.7, 5.8 from a loan standpoint and neither the remaining from the investors. So there was a portion that was raised for the down payment. And then also the... Uh, renovation so it came out to roughly about 2.8 how okay. that worked is did a co-investment of fifty thousand dollars but in essence just to make this all simple is the investors got 85 percent and then we got 15 percent and gotcha. uh as uh, and that's how that equity split was uh, broken down we also got fees up front too is revenue for putting a deal together such as an acquisition fee and there's ongoing fees that you're able to get as well so there's so many different ways to, to structure but i would say the end goal uh that really summarizes everything what do you want to give to your uh investors is that 50 percent that you're giving to them what does it come out to as a cash on cash uh, uh return and then right. also annualize that 50 percent could be uh, let's say a 5% return, and then it only comes out to a 10% annualized return. So right. that would be digging a little bit more into the weeds, which I mean, that's a whole nother uh, call in itself. But that's what I would just say is what your end goal is. Uh, let's say you want to give them a 10 to 12% cash or cash, and it does vary upon 
the the risk of the deal and then also what their annualized return is and now you back into the 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 equity splits okay got you i mean but for that particular example um because uh, you're because the example you're providing you're putting in quite a bit of capital into that deal i believe you should actually get more uh equity gotcha okay no i completely understand and 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 i didn't want to lose any of the listeners which is why i only did it 50 50 because and i'm glad that you gave that example because you know as you scale like in your journey you just come to, and you've heard it before you've heard the analogy before but it really doesn't play out until you get into the much more bigger deals where you're like yo i'd rather own one percent of a trillion dollar company rather than a hundred percent of a hundred thousand dollar you know company right and in but, your example but it comes down team. to what you're and i know i had cut you off excuse me on that it's, it, it, it it comes down to what your end goal is because mm-hmm which I very rarely meet uh, the, these uh, investors, but uh, is there's some investors that are on a certain scale to where they own 100% uh, to where they don't have to answer to investors and then 100% goes into their pocket and they don't have to split it with uh, investors and they're able to get to their end goal, let's say a lot quicker if they decide to go that uh, route. But it really just varies upon what the person's end goal is and then what they're willing to, to do in order to reverse engineer to get to that. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Uh, so in regards to mitigation, I know, um, are you working only with accredited investors uh, or do you have a mixed population? And also explain to our listeners, what is an accredited investor? Uh, so there is a mix of both non-accredited and accredited investors. And then sometimes depending from a legal standpoint, they have to be more of a sophisticated uh, investor. Uh, I don't want to go. So is a accredited investor and there's certain, there's actual, uh, what is it? not requirements there's a, but there's a protocol to it that they exactly these are investors. yeah these are these are already set in stone is that the person has to make uh let's say they're them being an individual it's either the past two to three years i believe it's two years two hundred thousand uh, dollars and then if it's jointly then it would be three hundred thousand dollars so a husband and wife or husband has whatever i'm not trying to be politically correct no but, this uh, is wrong yeah. man we are here we are serving yeah. everybody please don't like listen man. there we we're, go we're, yeah. we're being you blown. never we're know nowadays you know how it goes A-B- A-A-B-B's. We're, we're, exactly. we're oh, them man. days everybody everybody we're bringing it straight to you we're bringing the go to you yeah. and we're having yeah. fun with it don't kill us we're we're exactly especially it's, because we're learning how to adapt we're changing we're, we're adjusting with you so so bear with us as we as we adjust just we're giving you everything that you're looking for just bear with us yeah and uh and then also to have a net worth uh greater than one million dollars not including your yeah. primary residence and i believe there is one more of those but those are the the two main ones to be a accredited investors and a credit investor and then depending on how you're raising money this is all from a legal stand standpoint is are you general uh soliciting are you not general uh soliciting is that depending on the structure that you can go up uh you do is there's only a certain amount of non-accredited investors you can have and then you can only the the remaining on accredited that can be unlimited because how the sec views it is that someone who is accredited which how they you could take that how you want is more sophisticated from a investor standpoint versus someone who's not accredited and they like to like to just minimize the risk, obviously, for for Main Street, mm-hmm. and it's the it's the only reason why they choose to do this. But ironically, on the flip side, it's a very interesting thing because, quote unquote, accredited investors, you've knocked off a good portion of specific communities, and more importantly, and I didn't even know I even know that I knew the million dollar I knew the a million dollar net worth protocol. What I did not know is that that cannot be in your primary residence, and so many people, the number one like piece of wealth that they have is their home and their primary residence. So not only, you know, somebody can have a million dollar home and they still won't be able to be considered a credit investor if they're regularly, you know, working just a regular job and then don't have those those other assets, which uh, is, is very, very interesting. Um, and I didn't know that. Um, okay. Uh, take a quick step back just off of uh, finding deals because I know you mentioned you you started off with brokers. You, you realize that, you know, obviously, Let's beat them to it. Let's go behind the scenes. You mentioned drive for dollars as one of your lead generation strategies. What other things are you doing on the lead generation aspect? Are you doing direct mail? Are you doing text blasts? Are you doing 
uh, ringless voicemail? Um, what other things are you doing, if anything, that helps you create that deal flow pipeline? So the drive for dollars approach is not as scalable. So shortly after that, right. did that on the just that 46 unit. And then from there started pulling lists. So there are certain databases that are out there. I'm not affiliated with either of these. I personally do use them, though. Uh, one is Reonomy. Uh, and then the other is CoStar to where in any given market you can pull, let's say I'm uh, here in uh, Houston, Texas, is an example is that I can pull all the apartments between let's say 40 to 100 units that have been built before 1970 that haven't sold in the past five years, all that data is in these certain uh, databases. So pull the list and then start the uh, do calling. And then also I mix in direct mail, but the primary touch point is calling. I didn't realize that CoStar, I always thought CoStar was just like a, a, a another, uh, I believe it's the largest MLS uh, uh, yeah, for the they commercial are. end. And then LoopNet's yeah. right under them. And then they have like a CRE, XI, I believe, or something like that. I didn't realize CoStar was in, uh, I didn't realize CoStar, that's game changing. That's a gym. If people are like, like, that is a major gym because the thing about it, um, oh man, this, this, this is great. Cause this, this is like, I love when I can selfishly uh, take certain gyms uh, from our podcast guests. Here's the reason why I say that because the the small the other websites list builder melissa data um yeah you know, whatever the case that part right there is the hardest you can't really target those lar larger commercial deals those larger apartments those, it's more residential those, correct like not at all or list source or yep. 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 all mm -hmm. of them all rei rail just like lead sherpa i use lead sherpa for my text blast system but all of these, uh, majority of those platforms are for uh, smaller residential and, you know, one to four units. Um, uh, and you can't even really like segregate how many units they just consider four units under all, you know, part of one, you know, the one single family rule that we all are aware of. Um, but I never realized that COSAR, COSAR could be used as a list builder that is major. If people, if you don't know what we're talking about, just rewind it and just keep on listening to it because it's going to smack you in the face by the time that you're ready to get into these bigger deals. And then yeah. you're going to be like, that's what they were talking about. That's, that's, that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's funny. Amazing. Or they'll just okay? wake up in a sweat gym. or they, they've had a problem or something like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what Austin and Sterling were talking about. Talking yeah. about. That's, yeah, that's, exactly. that's, that's major. And also major. the other is Reonomy because these, and it's all subjective, uh, most people right. who are just uh, getting started is it could be quite the price tag. Uh, but the way around that is sometimes you can actually have a broker. They have access to this. They can pull the list uh, for you as well. So that's, oh, that's an, uh, another workaround that you can use. Nice. That's good. Nice. I'm sorry. I got to take my time away. No, 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 no. That's yeah, fine. Because yeah, yeah. we're going to start sending, right. sending into our core four. Uh, I put I put it in the, the chat. I think I spelled on... it right. But if yeah, it's something. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Okay. But that's it. more affordable than CoStar. Jonathan, we got an extra, uh, we got an extra 10 minutes uh, that Sterling made the note of. Oh, gotcha. um, so we'll be good. But so, but, but before, did you have one more question before I have my one last like question before the four four? Did you have one more? Uh, no, no, that's fine. Go ahead. All right. So, um, okay. So put like this, Sterling, what's, what's, where are you taking the business? Where are you taking the company? What, what's next for you? I mean, I'm pretty sure like the easy answer is just scaling, right? And, and you know, just rinse and repeat and doubling down on what's working. Um, but is there anything else that like you're excited to be working on or, or anything like that, that, that you're looking forward to? So interesting enough is, yes, still steadily looking for acquisitions, but more so have slowed down significantly and actually have been selling over the years just based upon how things are uh, at in the, the market. And then also Ooh. I've expanded out here to Houston, uh, Texas, which is where I actually uh, live. And one thing I would say, they say everything is bigger here in Texas, except the toilet that I have. It's the same size as the ones <laughs> back home. So that's a little disappointing. <laughs> Other than that, it's, all is great It's something out about you in bathrooms, man. It's something about you in bathrooms. You mess your phone up. <laughs> that's interesting. So, the, uh, so you're actually selling off. Okay. So are, are you just, are you just, are you, all right, so selling is an interesting concept now because, and I won't say concept, but you know, obviously some of the things that always are in the back of, of investors' minds, when to sell, is it the right time to sell? I mean, even like 
you know, because we have the equity, right? So it's not that selling like, you know, like, like losing money or anything like that. But, you know, do we cash out now? Do we reinvest? Do we, do we uh, beat up, quote unquote, our equity by uh, taking out a HELOC and then thus increasing our return on equity? Because most people will only focus on cash on cash return. And I'm a big proponent of return on equity where, you know, like, do I have too much equity in my property? Whereas if I were to refi or take out a HELOC, I can actually increase my return on equity position um, by taking on quote unquote more debt. What, what, what's been the, the reason why like you have been selling? And if it, um, there's not just the single families, are you, are you doing like buildings and, and the, the apartment buildings yes. that you're selling? So the 156 unit that I have, which is now under contract, is on our five-year projection we and that we're, we're two years into the deal we we had it selling at 9.8 million dollars and the offer that we have is actually just under 11 million dollars sure. so it's an offer that can't refuse and if people are that now is we don't have to take on that additional risk because this is a property that's about two million dollars going into it it's older uh, as well. So there's going to be the ongoing CapEx that's involved with it. So again, we took a step back and said, okay, we've got this offer that's well above market that's on our five-year projections. We can go ahead and take it. And at some point, I believe the market will start to turn, which I've actually started to see. And then that's when we'll have the capital ready to deploy. Because this is one thing I've studied from those who are even further than me. They've actually gone on dry spills to where, or they slowed down on their acquisitions. But when things started to turn, that's when they fully seized the opportunity and where they were able to, to scale the most. So it's just me learning uh, from that. It's likely to happen again because real estate is in cycles. I could be wrong though. What, what, what keeps you going? What, what keeps you going? You're, you're doing a couple of big deals. You know, obviously we're, we're, we're making great money, right? You know, and what, what keeps you going? Is it, is, what keeps you going? I'd say is that little kid uh, that is in the same position I was when I was a kid that had no clue if he was going to make it out. Uh, the unfortunate thing too is with my mother is every single day I felt as if I was walking on eggshells because at one moment she's good. Next moment, it could be a minute, two minutes uh, later that she's a completely different person. Uh, so I was completely scared in that in that sense. And I know there's a kid in that same setting, maybe not the exact same uh, situation with the, the mother, but let's say environment. And I want to be an ideal and a message to that kid that, hey, there is a there is a way out. You don't have to take this path that my uh, brother ended up uh, taking. So that's one as a, a motivation why I keep doing what I'm uh, doing. Uh, and then also I'm going to die someday. So uh, is what that is. Why not decide to to keep uh, keep uh, keep going and keep pushing to see how far I can end up uh, uh, taking uh, this thing that we call life. I, I love it, man. Just. Uh... Uh whatever you do man just don't die in the bathroom and we're gonna head into this call for a <laughs> on the small day. toilet <laughs> just kidding. average size toilet i'm gonna have That's to contact funny. my landlord and ask him hey what's going on with this toilet yeah, we need some, yeah, I think everything uh, was bigger here rent. wait oh interesting okay so you're paying interesting rent. right there so, yeah you're, you're, pay, right. you're paying rent yeah that's that's the philosophy i've always lived is i rent where i stay and I own where other people pay me. That's street, always been the street, process. Street Grant Cardone style. Exactly. And I just enjoy being mobile. Uh, yeah, that, that's just a lifestyle that I uh, have too. And when you own a house, again, there's pros and cons. Just for me, when I look at the, the cons and then also the pros is that it just makes more sense for how I live to not do that. And let's say the toilet does go out. I don't want to have to deal with that. I just call the landlord. They send the maintenance guy to do that versus if I own the houses, I now got to deal with that on top of everything else that I have to deal with running the company. That's interesting. I, I've adapted that philosophy myself and I've only what we can afford and my wife and I, we, we rent now and um, uh, it, it's easier. It's easier. I will, I will say that it's easier, much easier. Um, for where I live, I, I have a pretty, I have a pretty dope spot, which is cool that if I, if this was a condo or something like that, like it, it cost an arm and a leg. And, but however, for all my homeowners, what I've just come to realize is that 
the only part that bothers me is that it doesn't come back. That's the only part that like, that's the only part that bothers. This is literally the only thing that bothers me is just the fact that like, I know that the rent's coming out and it's not coming back. And it's the one thing that I wish I could like hold on to and just have that equity, like be, like for that very reason. It's it's literally the only thing. It's literally yeah, the only there's, thing. I what I've learned, like there's, there's trade-offs. Uh, Cause right, right, right. exactly what you mentioned, there's other pros on, let's say the time for, I mean, we could go down that rabbit hole, but I would just say at the core of everything, there's trade-offs. Right. Agree. Yeah, all right, point. let's jump into this core four. These are the four questions we ask all of our guests. Question number one is, what is your favorite aspect about real estate? I'd say finding deals. I'm a deal junkie. And Love when it. it's the whole process of going through it, that that so I enjoy the journey. And then when actually closing on the deals, like woohoo, on to the next one. All right. I, I love I, I love it. And real estate's so slow because I get like you get that initial high of putting that deal together and getting your offer mm -hmm. accepted, and then you gotta wait until like Patience. and it's like it's so painstaking because we're under contract. I, I can't talk about it. Just Jonathan might know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jonathan knows. Jonathan knows. <laughs> and I'm under contract on something that's amazing. And I and I'm like it's bothering me that like after the initial setting up the turn, setting up the purchase price, like I gotta like wait to for it to close and like. Obviously in real estate, we've seen so many things happen between getting your offer accepted in the closing table that like, oh God, I'm on, I'm to your point. I've had a fire happen at my 156 oh, unit, a fire happened, uh, wiped out. I wouldn't say wiped out, but eight units are currently offline. So that's a prime example of things that could happen from being under contract to now closing. And now we're going through the uh, back and forth with the insurance company because if you, okay, I could go now, but essentially is that they pay it out in that. thirds. They they pay because it's about a million dollars in which the total amount is that the uh, insurance company will give us to cover everything. Uh, yeah. But however, is they will pay that in thirds. But if you sell the property, they won't pay the, the last two payments to you. They'll just pay the upfront. So now we're negotiating to at least get 70% of that. And then we'll go to the buyer and say, hey, are you willing to uh, accept this? And if not, then we'll just hold on to the property and do it ourselves. So exactly what you mentioned, things come up and you have that risk. That's interesting, uh, especially on a larger scale. Um, uh, okay, question number two, definitely can't be, please, no rich dad, poor dad. Favorite business or personal development book? Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, founder of Nike. Oh, that book is awesome. I love it. I, I stayed up, it, I, I, I could- great things about it. You gotta I, read it, man. It's it's yeah. one of those books that was so wonderfully written that I actually felt at times when he was writing it, I was actually there. You know, I'm talking about John, where he talks yeah. about running, mm -hmm. and I was like, I, I was up at night uh, the in shoes my bed and, and the, 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 the 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 stitching of the shoes. Uh, I think I, I read that in one day. That's how good it was. Like I I, I couldn't put it. Down. I didn't do that. I mean, you're you crack right through that book, man. <laughs> I got it. Right, it's one or two days, but it, it's it's a good written book, and I always like to get an understanding of the background, how everything started, what what adversity that people go through, and they kept pushing and pushing. It, it it's pretty it's pretty awesome. Uh, I'm here for it. That, all right, I'll I'll add that to my book. Yeah, you have to add ever, that to the rotation. The ever going cool. book list. John, he's not going to add it. He said he's going to add it, but he's not going to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm it. Right it's, it and you know what's interesting? <laughs> if it's not, I guarantee you it's in my Amazon cart that like just like sits there. I got to wait till like next Prime Day. But like I just ordered like four books that, that just came in. And uh, oh, so I'll give I, you a hack is if you have a library card, you can use this app called Libby. And then you can just get the books uh, for free. I mean, if you if you want to support the, the author, that's the way to buy, you could do it that way. But through Libby is you just download the, the book. Sometimes you have to, to be in queue, which is weird because it's a digital book. But either way is oh, that yeah. you yeah. can use Libby and then you could just have the book instantly on your phone. At least I've got library cards. Yeah, it's a digital. Uh, oh, a digital yeah. library card. Mm -hmm. You can get the physical uh, too if you want to yeah. go old school. Uh, I guess I, you know what it is. I like. The, I like. The, I'm probably the only one that just still loves like the regular books. And you know what it is. Okay, it's, the, it's the trophy. Like once you're done, okay. it's the trophy. Once you're done, like you actually have something like tangible. Um, it, it's it's weird. I, I have a love hate relationship. Yeah, I, I do both. I it's do, annoying. Uh, I'm always reading like two or three books at the same time. I do one physical one audible because uh, i'm always on the road as well 
So Audible, I'm listening, the gym, listening. And I like to make my notes. But no, nah, nah, that's like, like one thing that I'm probably like the only old school like aspect about it. But I don't know. I like I like the bookcase. Makes me feel question, smarter. Question number three. When you're not finding deals, getting deals together, syndicating, what do you do in your fun things you do in your spare time? I study philosophy and I travel. Been to the DR. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, uh, Punta Cana. Uh, uh, e time bien, so I know Spanish too, and also, <laughs> uh, what do you call that? Uh, Santo Domingo, beautiful yeah, place. That's, that's where I'm places. from. That's uh, the the, the capital, yeah. Wow, that's where my family's from. I still haven't been to DR yet. We gotta go, man. I'm taking you, yeah, yeah. No, nah, whenever you want to go, uh, I still haven't been there yet. Right it's like now. the one place that like everybody goes to that I have not been there yet. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, island, it's a beautiful island, beautiful beach. I can imagine you, you, uh, but if you go to a resort, I would definitely get out of the resort and explore the island. Because for me, if you go into a resort, you could just go to a resort in any and any island, it's not worth mm -hmm. it. You have to go out and explore the city, the culture, the people. It's amazing. I mean, nothing but good things. It's 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 just a matter of time on the ever growing travel list, right? Ever growing book list, ever growing travel list. Um, okay, last but not least, Sterling. Uh, where can people find you at? Yeah, so you can find me sterlingwhiteofficial.com. That is sterlingwhiteofficial.com. And then also YouTube. I put quite a bit of content out there, about three to four, uh, what is it, pieces of content uh, per week. Uh, so that's another place where if you just want to catch up or jump on one of the live streams, ask any questions, uh, send me a new toilet, a uh, bigger toilet, if you happen <laughs> to have one uh, too. Uh, so yeah, that, that's that, that's. I'm going gonna, gonna to start a GoFundMe for you. I got it. <laughs> we're raising investor funds. We're going to syndicate <laughs> a new toilet. <laughs> That's amazing. Listen, I, I, here's an interesting question. This is, I promise, this is definitely us. Was there anything that we should have asked that we didn't that you want the audience to know? I'd talk about more on the side of mindset. I'd say one question or one thing that has really uh, helped me change the trajectory of my life was one, putting myself around the, the right people, but also just going deep into the Kool-Aid of self-improvement. So Earl Nightingale is who I first came across, the Norman Vincent Peels, the, the Tony Robbins, the W. Clement Stones. And mm. what I had to do was I had to remove a lot of the garbage that I had from my upbringing and my family, my mother, all those people did the best with the information that they had, but the information they had was what got them to that point and not saying anything bad about it. But I knew if I wanted to change my life for the better, I had to get more information, more empowering, and then essentially remove a lot of those previous limiting beliefs that I had. I love it. It is. That was a, that was a great 80%, ending. 80% mindset, 20% tactics. I would even put more mindset, to be honest. That's myself personally, how I view it. Uh, no, well, that's the law of import versus proportions in general. And and Pareto's, 99, Pareto's. And it goes 99, one, right? And Pareto yep. principle and, mm -hmm. and yep. so on and so on and so forth. I uh, I totally up for it. Sterling, man, I, I, I know you have to run. Uh, first and foremost, man, definitely thank you for, for taking the time to come on the show. Um, and, and, and dropping a lot of gems that, that are easy for, to, to grasp and actionable steps that everyone that's listening uh, can take step by step, slowly but surely. I mean, I've gotten stuff here, so I know people that are listening got amazing gems for it. So I'm going to go get to work right now. Uh, I might go find out who has CoStar or whatever I got to do to get up on here. There and, we go. Uh, and, and we make it happen, man. I, I greatly appreciate it without a doubt. And next time we're in H-Town, if you're still there, uh, if you're not traveling or back in DR, um, then uh, I, I'll definitely be sure to, to, to reach out and, uh, and be sure to connect with you when we're down there. All right, let's do it. All right, appreciate you too. Uh, enjoy. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the podcast and everyone who's listening. Keep going out there and making things happen. If you're on the fence or may have some limiting beliefs, just think at the end of the day, we only have so much time on, on this planet. And I know that it's cliche- to, to say but i mean it is what it is uh so it's either you take the time uh to go out there and make something of yourself or you could just live uh, average life which is fine but it just comes down to where you want to go i i love it man you're, you're truly inspiring just off of the uh simplistic nature of just how you do things and it's very it's very step by step not not 
rocket science and more of, of getting over, like you said, like the mental hurdles of, of believing what's possible. And uh, I love how you broke it down uh, for everybody in the audience. So that way, when as the more that we have the conversation, the more that we make it normal. And the more that we make it normal, the more that we're going to take the action. And then obviously we, we reap the benefits from said action. Got it. Without a All doubt, right. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I do have to go on this other call, but I do, do appreciate you, think, you guys having man. me on and uh, keep this making things the, happen. This is the Real Estate Blueprint Podcast signing off. All right, see you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.